John 21, verse 1, and the Word of God says, After these things Jesus showed Himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and on this wise showed He Himself. There were together Simon, Peter, and Thomas, called Didymus, and Nathanael of Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and two other of the disciples. Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. They say unto him, We also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus saith unto them, Children, have ye any meat? They answered him, No. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girded his fisher's coat upon, uh, unto him, for he was naked, and did cast himself into the sea. And the other disciples came in the little ship, for they were not far from land, but as it were two hundred cubits, dragging the net with fishes. As soon then as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish lay thereon and bread. Then Jesus saith unto them, Bring of the fish which ye have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of great fishes, and hundred and fifty and three, for all there were so many, yet was not the net broken. Jesus saith unto them, Come and dine. And none of his disciples durst ask him, Who art thou, knowing that it was the Lord? Jesus then cometh and taketh bread and giveth them, and fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to the disciples after that he was risen from the dead. So when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith to him again the second time, Simon, Son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved, because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thine hands, and another man shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spake he, signifying what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, Follow me. Then Peter, turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved, following which also leaned on his breast at supper, and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? Peter, seeing him, saith to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? Jesus saith unto him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Then went this saying abroad among the brethren, that that disciple should not die. Yet Jesus said, unto him, said not unto him, He shall not die, but if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? This is the disciple which testifieth of these things, and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which if they were written, every one, I suppose that even the world itself, could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. I want to draw your attention, if you would, to really our text here, in the middle of the text in verse 15. Jesus asks Peter three times, this question, lovest thou me? The first time he says, lovest thou me more than these? Then he says, lovest thou me? And again the third time, lovest thou me? And Peter's reply is, thou knowest that I love thee. Three times Peter says, you know, you know all things. And you know that I love you. And Jesus replied every one of those times. The first time he said, feed my lambs. The next two times he said, feed my sheep. But then he turns Peter's attention towards really a truth about life and says to Peter, you were young once, 
And you used to do things in your own strength, uh, but one day someone is going to have to do things for you. And the fact is that you're going to die, Peter, and your death is going to glorify me. But Peter, what you need to concern yourself is with this truth in verse 19. You, Peter, you, you follow me. I want to preach this morning, which is interesting, this is the closing chapter of the Gospel of John. This is the only gospel that really ends in this way. Uh, but here again, this concerns Peter. Now we see John throughout this passage, but this concerns specifically Peter. If we were remember a few chapters ago, Peter denied Jesus Christ three times that he even knew the Lord. Now we know Jesus Christ appeared in the upper room where Peter was, and he said this to Peter, Peace be unto you, as he addressed all of the other disciples. So yes, Peter was forgiven and Peter was restored, but really this is... Uh, Jesus Christ coming to Peter and dealing personally with Peter. And I believe what Jesus is doing here is restoring Peter to a place of leadership. To a place where Peter ought to be. But notice the instruction. He asked Peter, do you love me? Then feed my sheep. Your responsibility, Peter, is this. Follow me. Peter will see that in just a moment at the end of the chapter. He says, but what about John? And Jesus says, what is that to thee? You, you, Peter, you follow me. I'm going to preach this morning on this subject, a love that follows. A love that follows Jesus Christ. In this passage, although we could spend much time in looking at each verse and looking at the meaning of each word, I want to take this a passage, this chapter, in context of Peter's life, but also in the context in which we find, because really this whole chapter is about the, the Lord Jesus Christ dealing with Peter specifically. And really there is a struggle here, because if we remember the life of Peter, Peter has a tendency to say things before he thinks. Peter has a tendency, and I believe that Peter was very zealous. He would, if any of the disciples had an opportunity to lay down their lives for Christ, I believe Peter would be the first one. I believe so with all of my heart. He was the first one when the questions were asked to Peter many times. Peter was the first one to reply and give the correct answer. Although many times he did things that he ought not to have done, um, particularly the time when he took Jesus aside, as Jesus said, I'm going, to be, uh, I'm going to die and after three days I'm going to rise again. Uh, Peter took him aside and says, Lord, th these things are not going to be so. And Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. So Peter has a track record of a kind of being zealous, and I believe that Peter, throughout his ministry, you see he is genuinely a man that loves the Lord. You see, particularly in this chapter, he jumps ship to go meet the Lord, while the other disciples stay in the ship and bring the ship to shore. So Peter, I believe, has, is dedicated not like no other disciple, and I believe that Peter genuinely loves the Lord. But here's the problem. Peter loves the Lord. In the power of the flesh. You know, we can love the Lord today, but live our lives for Christ in the power of the flesh. I believe that there's no doubt because we see, and we'll just look at it in just a moment, that Peter looks to the Lord and says, Lord, you know that I love you, thou knowest all things. And Jesus Christ never questioned Peter's love, but what he does say, is follow me, feed my sheep. You see what he's doing? He's saying this, Peter, love me the way I, I want to be loved. You see, when, we, when it comes to the Lord and serving the Lord, we have our own ideas about how we ought to serve the Lord and how we ought to demonstrate our love for the Lord. But here this is bringing Peter back to a place of this, a love, a true love, follows the will of God follows the will of Christ. So notice here as we look at this passage and as we work our way through this passage, I want us to look at Peter and the fact that it is illustrated for us that Peter loved the Lord, but Peter is a man of the flesh. He's a man of action. He's a man that wants to see things happen. But he has to come to the place where he is totally dependent upon the Lord. So first of all, as we look in this passage, we see first of all the striving of Peter. The striving of Peter. Now the Bible says as we come to this last passage, we see that Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And on the wise showed himself 
And the Bible mentions to us who was there, Simon Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel of Canaan of Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, James and John, and uh, two other of the disciples that were there. Now it is interesting that they were instructed of the Lord uh, to uh, all come to a place. And by the way, they were in Jerusalem when Jesus Christ met them. But now they're going back to Galilee, which is north. And now apparently they're near the sea. And uh, Galilee, there's the uh, Sea of Galilee. And notice the Bible says in verse 3, Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. They say unto him, We also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship. Immediately in that night they caught nothing. Now, do you see what is illustrated here? Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. Jesus Christ has appeared to the disciples and has given them the message, Peace be unto you. As my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. There was a responsibility. And apparently here it seems to me that Peter got impatient on waiting of the, on the other disciples who had to make their way back to Galilee. And perhaps in his restlessness, he says, I go fishing. Now, apparently, it seems to us uh, that this was not what was supposed to be done. Uh, this was not what Jesus Christ uh, wanted. That, but Peter is restless, and Peter, a man of action and a man of, uh, of strength and power, we see when, when, a little later when uh, the, uh, the disciples were struggling with the, fishes, with the fishes in the net. The Bible tells us later that Peter pulled the net himself later. <laughs> So he's a man of great strength. He's a, a man of action. But here he says, I go a fishing. You see, uh, Peter illustrates for us uh, living uh, a life in the power of the flesh. I got to do something. I go a fishing. The Bible tells us, and then the other disciples look to Peter and they says, we go as well. Oh, we're going to follow you. And the Bible says, and they entered into the ship immediately. Isn't it interesting that there was no conversation there? Where aren't we supposed to wait for the other disciples? Are we supposed to wait for the other disciples to get here and to meet with Christ? But it seems here that Peter in his restlessness says, I go fishing. And then the other disciples says, well, let's go immediately. And the Bible says they went immediately. There was no debate. There was no questioning. Immediately they went to sea. And the Bible tells us in that night when they went out, they caught nothing. You know, it illustrates for us that in our striving and in our toils, as we serve the Lord, if we do things in the power of the flesh, and if we, even if we are enthused about it, we will be fruitless. That's what Peter was. There was no fish caught. Well, we continue reading the Bible says, And when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore. But the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. And Jesus saith unto them, Children, have ye any meat? Do you see here on the shore, as they've told all night, it's been a long night. I know how many of you have gone fishing, but typically when we go fishing, we like to catch something. That's why I like to go with someone that has experience. Because if I have no idea, I don't want to go, I want to catch something. But here, think about it. All night they've toiled, and they have caught absolutely nothing. And Jesus there is on the shore, and apparently they're not too far from the shore. And they don't, they don't know it was Jesus, but Jesus says, Have you any meat? A reminder, you have toiled all night, haven't you? You've gone fishing in order to catch fish. Do you have any meat? And can you see their answer as they have to answer that? They have to say this. There's no really con deep conversation. They just say, no. It's kind of, it seems like annoyed, doesn't it? And like someone says, you went hunting or you went fishing. Do you catch anything? No, I don't want to talk about it. That's, that's how we react. Why? Because, you know, we like to talk about it when we have the trophy. The fish was this big. See, there's the picture. There it is. No. You see what that was a reminder of? You work in the power of the flesh, Peter, and do your own thing and work on your own program. You will n accomplish nothing. And here Jesus Christ is forcing them to admit that in their own power, in their own strength, nothing happened. The Bible goes on to say in verse 6, And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. <laughs> now, <laughs> they've toiled all night. Now, they're about uh, not too far from the shore. And Jesus Christ says after the reply, No, we haven't caught anything. He says, Well, just cast your net on the right side of the ship. Now, the Bible says they cast therefore, and now there was not able uh, to draw it from the for the multitude of fishes. Isn't it interesting that at the moment that Jesus Christ spoke, at the moment that Jesus Christ cast your fish, as they obeyed the word of God, the fish come. 
immediately. Oh, may the Lord remind us here that when we work in the power of our own flesh, nothing gets accomplished. But when we surrender to God, His will, and His word, He brings the increase. He brings the fruit. He brings the meat. God provides it. He reminds Peter that you can do the work of God, Peter, but if you don't do it according to my word, you can accomplish anything. You have to follow my word. And they do. And the Bible says that the fish was, uh, that, that, there, that it was such a multitude they could not draw the fish in. Verse 7 tells us, Therefore the disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, It is the Lord. Now, John speaks up, and John is a man that's dear to the Lord, and the Bible indicates to us that he was the disciple whom Jesus loved, and there was a great relationship between Jesus Christ and John. And John uh, recognized it automatically, he says to Peter, It is the Lord. Who else has the power over the fish? Look, Peter, we've been sitting here. And really, really, he says to cast them in after toiling all night, and now we have a multitude of fish and we can't even draw them in. It is the Lord. When God does a work as His people submit to Him, we cannot but recognize that it is the Lord. We cannot but recognize and say, well, that's man's doing. When God truly does something... We, can, we cannot but recognize that it is the Lord. It's not man's doing. That's not Peter's doing. That's not the, the, these men's experience doing. It is the Lord. You know, there are many people today that trust in their accomplishments. They say, well, I've been in the ministry for 30 years, and I have a doctorate, and I'm this, and I'm that. But if you have all those things and work the work of God without Him, nothing will be accomplished. You see, we are totally dependent upon the Lord. And Jesus Christ reminds His disciples of that and it causes them to, uh, to understand and recognize it is the Lord. We ought not to be drawn by personality. We ought to be drawn by the Lord. It's a shame today that many churches are raised because people follow someone that they like. But as soon as that person drops off the scene, everybody leaves. That's not God's design. You see, we follow the Lord. We don't follow a person or a personality or someone. We have to recognize in the work of God, it is the Lord. The Bible says that upon hearing those words, now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, notice, he heard his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked and cast himself into the sea. So apparently David didn't have his, his shirt on. And so therefore he sees that it's the Lord. And out of reverence for the Lord he clothes himself. And he jumps ship. And he goes to shore to meet the Lord. Uh, you see, I mean, out of all the disciples, the Bible doesn't tell us that John did that. Although John was the one who disciple whom Jesus loved. But Peter certainly went out. He went out, he jumped the ship, and he met the Lord. He cast himself into the sea. And the Bible says, verse 8, And the other disciple came in a little ship, and they were not far from the land, but as it were two hundred cubits, dragging the, the net with fishes. As soon then as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and a fish lay thereon and bread. And Jesus saith unto them, Bring of the fish which ye have now caught. Jesus says, All right, bring the fish that you have now caught. At my word. This is not what you do. Because you're aware disciple. You've told all night. And you've caught absolutely nothing. But now. Bring the fish that you've caught. Upon your response. To my command. And the Bible tells us. Simon Peter went up. And drew the net to land. Full of great fishes. One hundred and fifty and three. 153 fishes. That's pretty specific. Now, does that remind, not tell us, show us something here? This is the only time that you find when fishers go out and there's a report of the exact amount of fish that there were caught. Out of a large net, 153 fishes. God is telling Peter, look, I know exactly what's in there. I know exactly what I've done. I know exactly what I want to accomplish. And so you see, Peter, you have no part in that. All you have to do, Peter, is stop toiling on your own, listen to my word, and just draw out the net. And there are the fishes, 153 of them. You see, the number ought not to concern us. What ought to concern us ought to be obeying the Lord. 
A lot of times people say, well, how many do you have in your church? Well, what's your offering like? What's your missions budget? Now, although we give those numbers as report, there's nothing bragging about us in our lives and say, well, this is how many people we run. It's the Lord. It's the Lord. Brother, this is not my church. It's the Lord's church. I should not be walking around and say, well, my people, they're not my people. You're not my people. You're the Lord's people. God's people. Now, the offering that comes in is not my money. It's the Lord's money. And as we consider this, uh, Jesus said there's 153 of them. And they've been counted out. And this has been the provision of the Lord Jesus Christ. And here in the opening of this chapter, we see a perfect illustration. Before Jesus Christ is going to ask, ask Peter some specific question, we see Peter toiling, struggling in his life without the Lord. But as soon as Jesus Christ comes on the scene, there's no struggles anymore when he submits to his word. So we have the striving of Peter. But number two, we have the supply of Christ. The Bible says in verse 12, Jesus saith unto them, Come and dine. And none of the disciples durst ask him, Who art thou, knowing that it was the Lord? Jesus then cometh and taketh the bread and giveth them and a fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to the disciples after that he was risen from the dead. The Bible tells us earlier that when they come on the scene, as soon as they were come to land, they saw a great fire of coals in verse 9, and fish lay thereon and bread. <laughs> you see here, Jesus Christ has been cooking with for his disciples. They come on the shore. And there's no time there. I mean, it's morning. They've been tolling all night, and now they draw in the fish, and Jesus Christ says, Hey, come. I got breakfast ready for you. They did not do a thing. Jesus Christ provided, supplied for them. You see what he tells Peter here? This is illustrated before he's about to have a conversation with Peter. You can, I know Peter, you'll love me. But here's the thing, Peter. You are toiling in the power of your flesh. Yes, I know Peter, you'll love me. But the fact is you have to come to the realization, Peter, that on your own you're going to struggle. But you have to recognize this. That I will supply what you need. Didn't he call Peter to be fishers of men? This is not just good for the physical fish. He will provide our physical needs. But it also applies the principle to fishing for men. Uh, Peter, you can go out and you can do things in the energy and the power of the flesh and accomplish nothing. But if you follow my word and my instruction, here's the thing, Peter. I'll provide everything that you need. So we see the striving of Peter, the supply of Christ, but number three, we see the struggle of Peter. So what is it that Peter was struggling with? Well, we find out in verse 15. The Bible says, So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, Lovest thou me more than these? Now there's been some debate about what are the these? The disciples? The fish? I'm not going to be categorical, but I believe it's talking about the fish. What is it that the chapter starts with? I go fishing. Before Jesus, before Peter made a decision to follow Christ and to forsake his career in fishing, it's not really a career, but his career in fishing, he had to forsake that, although we still find them fishing at times throughout their ministry. But here he said, I go fishing while he was supposed to do something else. Wait for the disciples and meet the Lord. He goes fishing. And so here, Jesus Christ asks them, Do you love me, Peter, more than these? Now Peter's reply is this. He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, notice, feed my lambs. Jesus Christ, without question, Peter says, Well, I don't know, Peter, if you love me or not. Uh, Peter, I, you know, I, I don't know, I mean, based upon your life, you forsook me three times. He doesn't say any of that. He says, do you love me, Peter, more than these? And Peter says, Lord, you know that I love thee. That I love thee. You know everything. You know that I love thee. And so Jesus simply replies and says, then feed my lambs. 
Peter is interesting uh, is interested in serving God, serving Christ while going fishing for fish. And Jesus Christ is interesting in Peter serving God and feeding his lambs. There's a difference. You see, for Peter, God's program was let me do my own thing. And Jesus said, Peter, do you love me? You know, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. Then do my program, Peter, not yours. Feed my lambs. He asked the second time and saith unto him again, the second time, Simon, son of Jonah, in verse 16, Lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said unto him, Feed my sheep. The third time, the Bible says, He saith unto him, the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, Lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him, The third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus said unto him, Feed my sheep. Although we could spend time in looking at those words that are used, the principle that is taught here is that Jesus Christ is trying to get the attention of Peter and says, if you love me, I know that you love me, Peter. I know that you have a desire to serve me. I know that you would lay down your life for me. But here's what I want you to do. Don't love me in the way you want to love me. Love me in the way I want to be loved. And if you're going to love me, feed my sheep. Feed my sheep, Peter. Do you remember last time Peter said, I would die for you. I would die with you. Though all men would forsake you, yet will I never deny you. Well, he denied him three times. I don't believe that has anything to do with Peter's love. I believe it has everything to do with Peter's flesh. You can love the Lord and be afraid to suffer persecution. But here... Jesus said, I want you, Peter, to serve me, not in the power of the flesh. I'll, 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 give what you, I'll give you what you need. You just follow my word. I'll give you what you need. He's just illustrated that for him. But then he says, look, if you're going to love me, Peter, what I want you to do is feed my sheep. I have a plan for you, Peter. And it's not your program, it's mine. Notice what he says here. He says in verse 18, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, When thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, and walkest whither thou wouldest. You see what he says to Peter? He says, Peter, you know, when you were young, I mean, you're, you're a pretty strong man, physically speaking. I mean, you pull the 153 fish up to the seashore on your own. You're a pretty strong man, Peter. As a matter of fact, throughout your younger years, everything that you wanted to accomplish, you accomplished. Nobody was going to stand in the way of Peter. Even when, you remember when the crowd came to take the Lord Jesus Christ, it was Peter that pulled out the sword. It was Peter that tried to chop a man's head off to protect the Lord Jesus Christ. It was Peter that stood up and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. It was Peter that stood up and did all those things and was the one that voiced his opinion, was the one that voiced his love for the Lord Jesus Christ, was the leader of the disciples. Even here when he says, I go fishing, all of the disciples went with him. He says, You're a powerful man, Peter. You're a man of influence. And in your young years, you've had power to do many things in the power of your flesh. But, verse 18, when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thine hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spake he signifying by what death he should glorify God. Peter, the first time in his honesty, said that he would die for the Lord? I believe he would have. But it was not God's design. Remember what Jesus Christ said when the crowd, he said, let these go, the disciples. Let them go back to their own places. They all forsook the Lord. Although Peter was willing to die, and Peter, we see, followed afar off. You see, Peter was willing to die for the Lord, but you, do we realize that? And with the Lord, do you realize that that was not God's plan? That was not God's design. Jesus Christ did not need Peter to die with him. Jesus Christ did not need Peter at that time when he was going to make the atonement for the sin of the world. Jesus did not need Peter to die and to lay down his life for Christ. He did not need it that time. Jesus Christ was the one who would make the atonement and nobody else could. That was not God's plan. What he did the first time and the things that he said was out of the energy of the flesh. 
was out of the power of the flesh. I'll do this for you, Lord. Peter, you're speaking of the flesh. You remember again when Jesus Christ said, I'm going to be taken in the hands of sinners. And Peter told the Lord, he says, These things shall not be so. Jesus Christ says, Get thee behind me, Satan. Why? Because Peter was responding out of the flesh. It's not going to happen. The flesh. He says, Peter, in your younger years and your years of energy and years of strength. You did all that you wanted. But you have to realize, Peter, that although I know that you love me, what I want you to do is feed my sheep. That's what I want you to do, Peter. And the fact is, one day, Peter, let me say, that when you get older, you're going to die and somebody is going to kill you. And it's going to be beyond your power. But let me say this, it'll be for the glory of God. It'll be the will of God that time, Peter. You see, the first time was the power of the flesh. But Peter, what you have to learn to do is not trust in yourself, not to wrestle in the power of your flesh. But what you have to do is be obedient to my will, follow me, and then one day you'll glorify me if you follow me, if you do want my will. You see, the struggle of Peter is this. I love the Lord. But I'm going to do things my own way. I'm going to serve God in the power of the flesh. I believe today there are many people who are sincere. Who serve God, but what they do is they serve God in the power of the flesh. They do things and say, well, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to build a church. I'm going to reach people. I'm going to be a godless testimony. I'm going to do this. But they do all those things in the power of the flesh thinking that they'll do something for God without God to prove their love. And Jesus said, Peter, feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Don't place your agenda and say it's God's agenda. That's a difficult thing to do. You know, we do that sometimes in our prayer lives. We have the idea sometimes, and we, we pray, and we want God to accomplish certain things, and we've already made a decision, say, this is what I want to do. And we pray because we want to tag God on the back, and God to bless the decisions that we've already made. And that's not the way it works. You see, God is the beginning of the decision. <laughs> He's not the one we tack on the back and say, well... God, uh, you, i got to use the name of God to make this whole thing sound spiritual. But it's not God's will. And that's the struggle that Peter is facing. So we see the striving of Peter, the supply of Christ, the struggle of Peter. But lastly, we see the surrender. So what did Jesus Christ say in verse 19? He says, When he had spoken this, he saith unto him, Follow me. All right. So, Jesus said, Peter, you were young and were a man of strength. One day you're going to be old, though, and people are going to take you, and you're going to die at the hands of other people. And that death is going to be for my glory. Peter, here's your responsibility. I know you love me, but here's what you have to do, Peter. Surrender your will. Peter, you follow me. Now notice what happens. This is, this is a perfect illustration of the struggles we face today. Verse 20. Then Peter, turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved following. Do you see the, the picture here? Jesus is telling Peter after this whole conversation, Do you love me? Thou knowest that I love thee. Feed my sheep. And Peter, you're going to die for my glory. This is what you do, Peter. Here, listen up, Peter. Follow me. You, Peter, you follow me. You see what he does? He turns around. He is concerned with the other disciples. He turns around and the Bible tells us he sees John following the Lord. Now I don't know at that moment if Jesus Christ began to walk. But Peter, before he uh, makes a decision to follow the Lord, he turns to the side and looks to the other disciples. 
And by the way, isn't that what we do? When Jesus Christ asks us to follow Him, we kind of turn around and uh, turn to the side and say, is anybody else following the Lord? Is anybody else going to do the right thing? Is anybody else going to serve God and do the will of God? And we turn around and we get distracted by those around us and we have the idea that, well, uh, let's see what other people will do. The Bible says this is the disciple who leaned on his breast at supper and said, "Jesus, uh, and said, Lord, which he that which is he that betrayeth thee?" That's Jesus. John had asked Jesus Christ, "Who it is that betrayed him?" And the Bible reminds us of this. And notice verse twenty-one: Peter, seeing him, saith to Jesus, "Lord, what shall this man do?" You see what Peter's concern here with Jesus Christ says, "You, Peter, you follow me." After he just said, "You're going to die, and your your death is going to be glory to me." You, Peter, you, you follow me. So John follows the Lord in Peter's hesitation. And now Peter says to the Lord, what about him? What's going to happen to John? Verse 22, Jesus saith unto him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. You see, Peter wanted to serve God without following Jesus Christ. You cannot serve God without following Jesus Christ. It is impossible. As he commands Peter, now that he has revealed to Peter that he would die as a martyr, Peter is instructed to follow the Lord. And Peter makes a, takes a moment of hesitation, if you would, and turns to the side. And he sees that John now follows the Lord. And he is concerned now about John, not about himself. He's concerned about John. And we see that John follows the Lord. And he says, oh, what does this man do? Jesus reminds him, he says, if, if, if he lives till I come again, what is that to thee? You see, this reminds us again. Peter wanted to be in charge. I want to know what everybody's going to do. I want to know how my life is going to go. I want to see the end of the road. And God, you just told me that my end of the road is a martyr's death. What about John? And Jesus said, don't concern yourself with John. You, Peter, you follow What is the greatest thing we can do in our lives? You know, people sometimes have things and people have titles and accomplishments that they put behind their name. And people say, well, this is this person's name. And well, look, at these are the things that he did. This is how he lived his life. May it be said of all of God's children, you know, him, her, follow the Lord. You know, Peter, he followed the Lord. You see what Jesus Christ is saying? Peter, don't concern yourself with the end of his life. You follow me. John, don't concern yourself with the end of your life. You just follow me. And when we follow the Lord, a step-by-step -step following the Lord, we don't have to concern ourselves because we understand, as he just illustrated to the disciples, I am in complete control. I will give you the fish that you need. I will provide for you what I called you to do. I'll meet you and I'll provide for that need. Don't concern yourself with other people around you. You concern yourself with your primary responsibility and that is to follow Jesus Christ. It is not for the, just the preacher. It's not just for the deacon. It's not just for the pianist. It's not for those in full-time ministry. It is for every single born-again Christian has a desire to say, I'm going to follow the Lord. And we don't need to concern ourselves with everybody else around us. We simply need to ourselves obey the Lord. When we become distracted, that's when trouble comes. But when we keep our eyes on the Lord and follow Him, then He works all things. You know, in a church, the greatest thing that you could do in this church is follow the Lord. As soon as you as an individual stop following the Lord, trouble's coming to this church. It is. I have a responsibility to follow the Lord. You have a responsibility to follow the Lord. And you see, as we all follow the Lord, we all meet at the same place. 
we all meet at the Lord. Because we're striving to follow Him. But when we're all doing our own thing, that's when conflict comes in. That's when, there's, uh, when we're concerned about what other people do uh, around here. We're concerned about well, what, what are they doing and uh, why, why are they doing this and what about me and what about my life and what's going to happen in, in the future and all those things. And that's when uh, conflict and heartache and all those things happen and really destroys people's lives. Why? Because we're living in the power of the flesh and we are not following the Lord. And Jesus simply says this morning to us, Do you love me? I believe that every honest person born again today this morning would say, Yes, I love the Lord. And I believe the Lord would respond and we, we would all say, Lord, the Lord knows. You're in church this morning. I know you love the Lord. But you know what He wants of you and me? To follow Him. Follow Him. Let's follow the Lord together till He comes. Let's pray.